The following podcast was recorded on Wednesday, April 26, 2023, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by sending an email to Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to Talking Data. I'm Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Good afternoon, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim discusses the latest with banking, deposits, and the debt ceiling. Jim, start us off today. What's the latest with banking? So uh, we've all been looking at the banking situation and we've all been thinking that it was getting better depending on what you thought the situation or the crisis was and how you defined better. But then it all changed on April 24th, two days before we were recording, when First Republic reported their earnings results. And two things happened there is there, the, the Wall Street consensus was they were expecting a deposit outflow of about $40 billion out of the bank. They reported a net deposit outflow of $70 billion. Now, what does net mean? That means that, first of all, J, headed by JP Morgan, 11 banks actually put $30 billion of deposits into the bank. And they're saying they got 70 out with the 30. In other words, $100 billion came out. 30 from these banks went in. That's what I mean by net 70. 100 billion is basically all their deposits. Then their, their, their earnings call was 12 minutes, no questions. They just ran through a couple of bullet points and that was it and they hung up the phone. So they really didn't you know, clarify anything. And then the day before we're recording, they came out and they announced that they're going to sell $100 billion worth of securities off of their balance sheet. Well, that makes sense. A deposit is a liability of the bank. So if your liabilities went down $100 billion, your, your assets are going to go down $100 billion too. <clears throat> so that's why they're selling them. So this bank is going to wind up becoming a shell of its former self, if, if, even if it makes it that far. Ultimately, I think that First Republic is not viable in its current form. It's either going to be acquired by a larger bank or consortium of banks to kind of keep it afloat, but then it won't be First Republic as we know it, it'll be part of this consortium, or it's gonna go into receivership and wind up being with the FDIC, which we would classify as another failed bank. But it'd be hard to see how it's gonna continue. But what is interesting about this is as the data was getting better, a lot of people were looking at the data and saying the one thing that kept disappointing through most, but not all of the data, was the deposit outflows were bigger than everybody thought. Oh, but the lending was okay. The, you know, the asset quality was okay, but the deposit outflows were bigger. That was something that was consistent through many of the reports and especially with First Republic. So what is the latest with deposits? Yeah, so if we go to the first chart, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna show here the problem with uh, what's going on. The blue line on the chart is market base rates, money market rates. They're up to 4.7%. That's the average money market rate in the United States. And I might add, we're recording one week before the Fed meeting, and there's a 90% chance that the Fed is going to raise rates again at the next meeting, 25 basis points. So all things being equal, these money market rates at 470 should go, this is the average in the United States, should probably average somewhere around five by say mid to late May, once that 25 basis point hike gets filtered through into the system. The orange line is deposits in the banks. The average deposit rate is 50 basis points. That gap of more than 400 basis points is simply too wide. And what I mean by simply too wide, now I've talked about this in many of these podcasts here and in other venues, People are picking up their phone. Here's my phone. They're picking up their phone. They're getting on their banking app and they're moving their money to a money market fund, a treasury bill, um, an ETF, short-term ETF for a FinTech company that's offering them a higher yield. So what you're seeing, if you go to the next chart, 
is you're seeing that the deposit outflows are just relentlessly continuing. So the top chart shows you the total deposits. These are other deposits, so this excludes jumbo CDs. This is savings accounts and checking accounts. It peaked last March, March last year, when the Fed started raising rates, and it has been accelerating since January. Every week this year, there has been a deposit outflow, except for the week ending April 5th, but then you had a bigger deposit outflow in the week ending April 12th. Friday, in this, this coming, the end of this week we're recording, we're gonna get the data through April 19th, and that is the day after taxes were due, and it's not uncommon to see a hundred or two hundred billion dollar outflow out of the banks to, for people to pay their taxes. So we should see another gigantic red bar coming, you know, the in the late next deposit data. But the larger point is the deposit outflow is accelerating. I've referred to it as a bank walk, a bank run. We all know what it is. The walk is people are not afraid of their bank. They're, they're frustrated with their bank. They want more than uh, half a percent, or in the case of the big banks like B of A and JP Morgan, Chase, one basis point is all they're offering for their, for their basic deposit rate. Now I'll just move it into a money market fund. And people will say, yeah, but it's kind of difficult. You gotta move the money back to pay your mortgage or your car payment. Oh, well, yeah, well, when it's one basis point worth of five, it's worth my effort to do it. If it's one basis point worth versus half a percent, I might not bother with it. So that's why that spread between deposits and interest rates has to close in order to stop this bank walk. It doesn't have to close all the way. And the final thing I'll mention too is the banks are giving you about half a percent of a deposit rate, 470 on its way to five for market rates. Why don't the banks raise their deposit rates? Well, there's no statistics on this directly, but it's understood that all of the assets of a bank, the securities they own and the loans that they've given out, yield them or throw off about 3% interest a year. Now the bank has expenses as well too, uh, <clears throat> maybe you know 50 basis points to 100 basis points, depending on how well the bank is run. So in order to stay profitable, just zero profitability, they probably can't raise their deposit rates more than to two to two and a half anyway. And other than the largest banks, most of them are there. Why don't they raise them to four? Because they're not making that much money on their assets. Now, in a year or 18 months, when these mature, when these securities mature and these loans come due and they roll them over in higher interest rates, they might get to a 4% or four and a half percent return on all of their assets and they could raise their deposit rates then into the three or 4% range. But that's in a year or 18 months. People have left every week, but one this week. There's going to be a giant outflow because of taxes in the latest data for the 19th. And then for the data through the 26th and May 2nd, which is coming, there's going to continue to be outflows. There should be. It's the rational thing to do. So yeah, they're not. They'll have higher yields, but they need the higher yields by 4:30 this afternoon, not in a year or 18 months. The point is, the Fed has raised rates too much. So this bank walk, I've been joking with the metaphor, saying that if the Fed raises rates to five percent, and a lot of money market funds are advertising a five percent yield. It might become a power walk or maybe a light jog, you know, and it's not that I'm afraid of the banks. It is run to higher yields. Now, tying this into what's happening with First Republic and the other regional banks, it's just encouraging people again to think about this stuff and think about what to do with their money. And most of them, when they think about it, their conclusion is something that yields four or five percent, which is money that is not in a bank. Uh, and the last thought I'd give you, at least on this section, is the latest M2 data came out and it showed a year-over-year -year decline of 4%, the biggest year-over-year -year decline since 1932. And it's gotten a lot of people's attention that money supply is contracting at its worst level in 90 years. Why is that? It's not money is disappearing. <laughs> it's that M2, the basic money supply statistic, is what they call liquid and readily spendable. People are moving their money into places that are liquid 
maybe a fintech firm, or maybe a T-bill, but it's not readily spendable. And now those are categories or an, e or an ultra short ETF that buys treasury bills. And by the way, for those you go, really, there's such a thing? Yes. And it is the hottest growing category in all the ETFs in 2023. Two years ago, you'd ask, why would you even make such a thing? But now it's all of a sudden, it's the hottest category out there. Um, these are not what the, the Fed calls readily spendable, but maybe they should redo their definition because people have these. I'm holding up my phone again. And they jump on their phone app and go, yeah, I can keep my money in a T-bill or I can keep my money in an ETF that buys T-bills. I can move it back into the bank in 30 seconds and then it's readily spendable, but it's not part of the M2 calculation. So what you're seeing with the fall in M2 is the same the bank walk. They're going to things that have been defined as not readily spendable, but because of because of technology, mobile apps, most people think it, it is. And for them, it actually is because it's just a minute away from moving it back into the regular bank account and then paying with their debit card um, or, or, or paying a bill directly using their bill paying function with that money once they've moved it back into their bank account. So Jim, what's the latest with the debt ceiling? So let's go to the final chart. <clears throat> and this final chart has been getting a lot of play, a version of this. The blue line is the treasury, <coughs> excuse me, the treasury bill yield curve. And you could see, and that horizontal uh, vertical line on the chart is the is July 31st, the expected X date. That's the last date that, or that's the date they have to raise the debt ceiling. Um, otherwise we default. By the way, yes, X date is a new term within the last week or two. We just called it the day they have to raise it, but now we call it the X date. So that's a new term. And a quick word on the X date, the treasury department within the next week is expected to just tell us what that date is. Right now, you've just got Wall Street guessing at what that date is, but they should, and basically they'll get all the tax receipts in and they'll do all of their, they'll update their spreadsheets and they'll figure it out. And, they'll, and Janet Yellen will come out and say, this is the day that they have to raise the debt ceiling or we go into technical default. So if you look at the bill curve, the blue line, you see that there's a giant drop in yields very, very short term. And the bottom, the horizontal axis shows you when these bills mature. So bills that mature before, you know, um, early June or into May are trading down under 4%. And then they spike up big in early June, and then they go up to about 5% by summer, and then they go back down. And a lot of people have said, this is everybody, you know, money market funds and everybody else shifting ahead of the X date. Now, why would you do that? Real quick, the SEC has suggested, not ruled because we haven't had this issue. If you are a money fund, let's say today, the day we're recording is April 26th. Let's say that I own a treasury bill and it matures on April 26th. And today was the debt ceiling limit and they didn't raise it. I don't get paid today. I have this treasury bill. I'm supposed to get all my money back on it and I don't. Now, if they raise the debt ceiling later today, I could get paid tomorrow. And so I would then get fully paid tomorrow. The SEC has ruled if that happens, I have to value that bill at zero for my money market fund net asset value. So if 2% of my fund is in that bill and they don't give me get be paid on it, I value it at zero. I report an NAV of 98 cents. I broke the buck. And we know from 2008 that that's opening the gates of hell and all kind of havoc is, is created because people expect their money fund to be as good as money as cash and be pegged at $1 all the time. Now, the following day, I could get paid and I could go back from 98 cents to a dollar. But that's the way they, they've ruled it. So money funds don't want to break the buck. So they try to clear out away from that X date. You know, buy stuff that matures before it, buy stuff that matures a month or two after it on the assumption we'll eventually work this out because we have no choice, but we have to just avoid that. So that's why people are saying that the bill curve is so low in the front. But if, if they're shifting from those July bills, which is around three months down to one month to avoid the X date, then you should see those bills at the three month rate be very high. That's now I bring in the orange line here. 
That is the forward Fed fund futures. That is where does the market think the Fed is going, the, the Fed funds rate is going to be, where the Fed's going to put the Fed funds rate for the rest of the year. <clears throat> From three months or July through through next April, the orange line and the blue line trade right on top of each other. That's the way they should be trading. So the three-month bill is not at this ultra high rate because everybody sold that, that rate went up, bought a bunch of one-month bills, and those rates went down. The three-month bill is not high. The one-month bill is very low. What's going on here? New money. Money is plowing in from the bank walk. So I think when people look at this, they're conflating what they're seeing with the debt ceiling. And there is some of that. Now, there's no doubt people are shifting you know, away from the X date <clears throat> forward to try and avoid it. But I think what's really driving this is well, I'm taking my money out of the bank. I'm putting it into a money market fund. The average maturity that a money market fund holds in the United States is 26 days. And that's calculated by S&P or one month. So they're buying one month bills. And that's why we've got this overwhelming amount of buying in the one month sector. And those rates are down so much. So I think that that's what's been going on. As far as the X date goes, it's not really impacting in the market. Now, maybe when Yellen gives us the exact date, the phrase we like to use is we'll see a big hump in the yield curve around that date where the yields spike higher. Nobody wants to own these bonds. They sell them, the price goes down, the yield goes up. Maybe a hedge fund or two will buy them because they don't have to mark the market every day. And so if they have to withstand one or two days of zero pay delayed payment, that's okay for them if they're given up a high enough yield. But right now you're not. Uh, so I think what we're seeing here in the market is I think we're overdoing the fear of a debt ceiling problem. And what we're actually seeing is this bank walk. And what's happening with First Republic is going to inspire more bank walk when the Fed raises rates. It's going to inspire even more bank walk. And we're going to continue to see bank walk as we move forward. And that's why we're going to continue to probably see this yield curve, this Treasury bill yield curve, Something that no one has thought about in 40 years because there was no reason to because for the last 14 years, it was all stuck at zero and who cared. But now all of a sudden, it's become kind of the center of the financial universe between the debt ceiling and the bank walk. So the yield curve is, I don't think, signifying a debt ceiling concern. It would if you saw the blue line way above the orange line, meaning, well, we expect the Fed to go to 5%, but why are the Treasury bills trading at 570 just to throw out a number? because no one wants to own them and you have a big fat yield to attract any kind of buyer. And then why are the yields trading at 350 on the short end? Because everybody wants to own stuff that matures before the X date. So we're not seeing that big hump yet. So I think the answer is that it's all more bank walk. Maybe when Yellen gives us the actual X date, that hump might reform around it. But as of recording this podcast, it's not there. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today, and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions about Arbor Research, Bianco Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day, everyone.